So this is really talking about different kinds of environments. And here we call it different environments for every season, but it's different environment for every reason. And the notion is that you have a variety of loops and cycles and you interface with other teams with their own loops and cycles. And so this talks really to discuss how many different kinds of sandboxes or environments that you could have to support your application. Now, a lot of teams in the beginning will start with one or two, a CI, an integration, and then a production. But really, in a lot of places, you'll end up, it's not a surprise if you end up with six or seven different environments. So the idea is you want to line up with your partner teams, whether they're information producers or information consumers, whether they're third parties that are external. The basic idea is that you line up where your work settles for them to integrate with you and for you to end up with a reasonable production product. We're going to balance the amount of work it is to create sandboxes versus the amount of stability you provide other teams and the work reduction and having to retarget different environments and manage competing life cycles in the same environment or sandbox. So I always find this interesting. You talk to ISVs and they are always, when I say ISV, I mean software vendors for like third party COTS products you're thinking of buying. And half the time they have no idea what you're talking about when you have environments. And that's because they don't dog food their own product. They don't actually, a lot of times it doesn't seem like they use it to run their business. So they don't write software on top of their software. So in your case though, your environment probably looks some crazy thing, right? Like you've got a bunch of components. I only drew two here because I got tired. And then you've got, you know, dozen partner teams or half a dozen teams or teams that feed other teams. So you've got serial, you know, N deep constructs going down to some other data store. And so you do some testing that's very shallow, but when you start getting all your partner teams involved, suddenly you end up wanting to have stable places for them to work so that you can go and churn in some sandbox where you need to get your work done. So if we look at that, For your next release, right? So a lot of what you're going to work on is what's in your next release. And then you've got to leave breadcrumbs and sandboxes behind for your current release because other people are releasing code against your current release, not your next release, right? So you develop against other people's future and you develop against their current. Hey, I'm in the cloud. I want to use Amazon's APIs. I'm developing against their current release, right? So they have to have a sandbox that that works against. That's not a really good example because in their case, you just stand up something and then you tear it down, but you get the general idea. So for your next release, what do you normally got? You got a development sandbox. That's like where you have your development database and maybe some of your components that are kind of stable deployed so that developers don't have to run all the components for your team, right? Then you've got integration testing, yours. And when I say yours here, I mean it's integration testing for you to make sure your components work with other people. So you do a deployment every night or every couple nights, probably every night, and you run deploy into there and you integrate and you see if it works against other teams' semi-stable code. This is the semi-stable semi zone. You also have quality assurance yours. This is where you run quality assurance for your stuff. You're going to be wired into a whole bunch of other systems where they go, right? Like the systems you talk to in production, but kind of their quality assurance support areas. So you need stable environment for the partner teams that you're dealing with. And then you need the place where you can push out new code like every three or four days in a two week sprint, you're going to have to push it out a few times. So it's got a little bit longer life cycle than integration testing, but this is basically where you do your deeper testing that you didn't just do kind of your functional autom or your integration testing. The next one is performance testing. Some places will reuse an existing environment, but basically with the cloud, it's kind of cool. If you want to do some kind of performance test, you can spin up a new cluster of servers, maybe with mock backends, or maybe with real backends because you don't know how to mock. And then you can spin up a set of load generators because the cloud will let you set, spin up a bunch. On-prem, a lot of times people have a couple machines that are dedicated for load gen, and then they'll have some performance testing environment maybe that's permanent. So it might be a little different based on whether you're on-prem or in the cloud, but the basic idea is you need a place to do performance testing. Some people will reuse their QA environment that means they can't do any QA testing while they're running performance tests. Another one is UAT. A lot of times when you get out of performance quality assurance, your team has said it's awesome. Now you got to give it to the users. So that might be the week before a release or maybe at the end of every sprint if you're not doing a release every sprint and your users get in there because you know they're never interested in testing until the week before a release. Otherwise, they got other stuff to do. So this is another environment that tends to be very stable. The final one I was going to say is external user testing. So some places... 
have external users. They have an internal app and maybe a customer service app and an outbound app. In that case, they will have a separate external testing environment that's got all kinds of crazy security on it. So sometimes that'll be like in a prod zone or a lockdown zone. Some places will use a user acceptance test environment and they will temporarily order, open a portal. So it comes down and down to your security and how often you have to do external user testing versus kind of end user product owner testing. So that's all what you're doing for your next release. For your current release though, you actually have to support code fixes in your current release and you got to submit support having current code somewhere where your partner teams that are going to release in between your releases have a place to come test against. So the first one of those would be a patching CI environment. A lot of places will build a CI continuous integration environment for their production branch and they'll just migrate that guy across production branches. That way if you make patches on the production branch you actually run tests. Have seen a couple places that don't do this and then they find out that none of their tests run in their production branch because the developers detect in a quick fix and then it turned out it broke some of the test. May or may not have broken the app, but it's not always really good to work that way. For your current release, you have integration testing for others. So a lot of times you'll release new code in the integration environment on a regular, really often for yourself, but you might have a separate integration. Sometimes it'll be called like QC integration instead of integration testing. And in that case, it'll be where other teams can deploy their code in the middle of their sprint to go against your services that are up. The reason we have testing and QA different for this is a lot of times you'll have database differences. So you'll have different data protection levels or you'll have different databases, basic idea. Another one, you'll have quality assurance for others. So other teams have QA, they wanna run QA and they don't wanna be down when you're like deploying into your QA environment. So this may drag, um, this basically represents, so you don't have to flip your QA environment back and forth between your next release and your current release for other people to test. This gives them a stable environment to wire into your system so that they can run their quality assurance against your current release. So what else is on the current release? Of course you got prod, that makes sense. Otherwise you don't have a current release if you're not in production. And then a lot of places will have a production-like environment where you can do production triage that is guaranteed to have the current production code with the right switches on and stuff because sometimes quality is a little bit different. Some places will skimp on one of these. You might only have a QA PM, like QA production mirror, and you'll use that for production triage. That tends to be, either way, the production triage environment is usually deployed to after production so that it always mirrors what's currently in production. So you might not end up with all these, but what are we looking at here? We're looking at 11 different environments. We could probably make up a whole bunch more, but it's easy to see how many IT shops end up with six or seven environments so that they can uh, support their testing on their future release and uh, troubleshooting and all that kind of stuff. And they can support their partner teams and troubleshooting against the current release. So how might you wire all those together in those two pipelines? So here is kind of the standard pipeline for a lot of people. So we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe nine if you did mock integration. White here means developers have full access. Yellow means they're pretty restricted. Red means it's under production controls. Maybe if you have SOX or other compliance. So CI is continuous integration. Those are unit tests. A lot of places will run if they can afford, if they have a kind of a highly driven team, they want to do integration testing every night and they don't trust their integration partners to be up and they don't want their test to fail. So they will build mock services or buy mock services that sit behind their nightly builds. Other places or many will also have a dev integration environment. That's really where you integrate with partner teams. You basically roll out your daily code. Sometimes everybody's rolling out daily code and integration. So this environment can be busted a bunch of times or maybe you're pointed at other teams' semi-stable integration environment, but this is really where you push your daily code. The next one is QA, which makes sense. Everybody probably knows what that is. It's really your quality assurance environment. You probably also have a performance test environment. Some places will use QA for that, but a lot of times you have to scale it up or it has to have a different shape and have uh, test engines, test generators. So some places will have a QA a QA PM for Prodmir, like I talked about before, and they might have a perform Perfmon environment, or you'll hear it called load test. <clears throat> when you really get serious towards the end of the pipeline, user acceptance testing, it was kind of a lot of times it looks pretty production-like because you want it to smell the same as it will in Prod while people are testing it. You have production itself, and then we talked about it before, you have a Prodmir, which really is the production triage environment. Some places will call it triage. It has the latest code so that when you're trying to understand why something funky is happening, 
You don't have to tear down your QA environment and stop test on your next release. So this is kind of the mix of this. Like I said, some of these can be collapsed or sometimes they'll be collapsed and split on demand. The next one is really, what are you gonna do for a current release? So that was all about you, baby. Next release is all about you. The current release is really, in a lot of cases, is, well, I guess I could have put prod mirror there, um, is really about testing what's happening today, right? So they'll have an integration prod mirror and a QA prod mirror. Dude, we need to do some patches. What are you going to do? On your branch, you're probably going to put a CI build. I didn't draw here because it didn't look pretty. They'll also might have a release branch integration or release branch QA prod. A lot of times we might use a QA prod mirror. So if the prod mirror is not actually in the production area, if the prod mirror is kind of in QA, you might use it for that. And then you have production. That's how you do the current release. Another one here is you have... Others versus your current release. I should change this so that it says uh, yours. The basic idea here is that other teams need to integrate and test against what you have in production so they can release out of phase with you. You have a partner integration. That could be your regular integration or it could, well, it probably can't be, right? Because your regular integration is going to have your future builds on it. So a lot of times you'll leave behind a partner QA and a partner integrate. They could use your prod mirror if you had a QA prod mirror. So partner QA could be the same thing. It just kind of depends on how you align it, what you're looking for. So the last thing here is, you know, really, what kind of trade-offs are we talking about, right? The fewer environments you got, the less work you got on the infrastructure side. The more environments you have, the better isolation you have for partner teams. And so that you get environmental stability, you don't have to be flipping an environment, I've seen this before where, oh crap, we need to do a production check. We're gonna turn QA into production like that changes us a bunch of things in that environment. We need to point at a different database, that kind of thing. So you gotta evaluate the trade-offs. What kind of what you know, what kind of processes your team got? What does it really want to support? Um, what, what kind of uh, agile versus uh, bigger software dev? Even then, if you have a lot of continuous delivery hooks installed, um, adding extra environments, you know, you can either do it on demand or you may have them stood up, but you tend to be more into that because you want to do more rigorous testing as you're in these fast cycles. The other thing is if you're looking at the cost and complexity and overhead of this, continuous delivery pipelines can help you with this. If you have full, like we are in an environment, I'm in an AWS environment right now. And basically we have seven environments. They're all fully automated in Jenkins in this case. I've seen it done in TFS for .NET, but it was done in Jenkins. So if we need to push to a new environment, we just hit a button, servers are automatically built and provisioned, auto scale groups are created, codes deployed, and we have an environment set up. You really can't quite do that if you're heavily integrated with other teams because they'd have to do the same thing, but you could tear your an environment down completely so you don't have to pay for it when you're not using it and then hit the build button in your delivery tool and it would spin back up a well-known environment when you need it. It's kind of cool. So I'd highly recommend you look at that if you're in the cloud. It's one of the advantages of being in the cloud. So cloud automation makes this easy. You can reprovision a known environment with known endpoints or you can tear it down when you need to and then you could scale it back up to be useful. So that's really all I got on this. The basic idea is think about what your pipeline looks like and don't be afraid to stand up an extra sandbox that has a specific purpose and you may decide you like that and you want to do more of that or you may decide you want fewer of those. It really comes down to how your team operates and how complex your software is. That's it. Thanks.